morning, FCC family. As we start our praise music, our first song is Open My Eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you.
ICC family and friends. It's good to see everyone again. I was watching some of your comments that you're posting. Glad to see so many are watching us today and are with us in spirit. Have you been practicing and working out your homework that I asked you to do last week? You know, the homework where it says Christians are like trees and you have to work out a plan of attack to be like a tree, to grow deep, to grow tall, and to grow wide. And to bear fruit. Are you working on that? I hope so. It would be a great thing for our church if every member in this church laid out a plan to reach someone and figure out how they were going to do it effectively. Well, you know, today's sermon, we're moving on. And it's another why question. So, in our society, we have things that tell us to keep calm and be happy. That's the first one you might see a lot. Just keep calm and be happy. But why? Let's go to our next comment that people say. Don't worry, be happy. You know that song. I'm not going to sing it, but you know it. Don't worry, just be happy. But why? Let's go to our next one. If you think happy, you'll be happy. So positive thinking creates a positive thought process and a positive attitude and a positive lifestyle. Let's look at our last one. Be happy and smile. So what those tell us are, what you'll see in the most social media now and all the world around you says, hey, you have to be happy. You have to be happy. But why? Why should I be happy? Because I'm a Christian. That's what we're going to look at. Not why the world says we should be happy, but why God says we should be happy because we're a Christian. There's three reasons we're going to look at today to tell us why we should be happy to be Christians. doesn't mean our life is going to be perfect and that we should be happy, 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 happy all the time. It just means we have three reasons to be happy when everyone else is sad around us and when we feel sadness coming on, we have three reasons we should look to God and say, oh, you're right, God. I should be happy. I should not let depression rule me. I should not let this world bring me down. And the first one is, I and you are redeemed by the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19 tells us this. It says this in 1 Peter 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see, we, why are we be redeemed? Or we are, I am redeemed by the Lord. You are redeemed by the Lord. The passage tells us that a great price was paid, a price that no wealth on this earth could do for us, a price that had to be a life. That's what we should be happy about. Someone, and not just anyone, but our Creator decided, do you know what? Before time began, it says in verse 20, He was chosen before the creation of the world. Jesus agreed to a plan, He did. And that plan was that when we create this world, God, and we put these humans on it, and we know they're going to mess up, we know that they're going to mess everything up and walk away from us, God, and nothing on this earth, no material item is worth their value. It's going to cost me my blood, and my life. So we understand this as Christians. So if you understand that, you realize how precious you are and how forethoughtful God was to think about you. And he said, you know, look, look, I'm going to think about this person. Generations upon generations upon generations before they're born, I'm going to lay out the plan for them. You are that thought out. You are that precious to him. So the result is, we should be happy that we were considered worthy. We should look when life is looking ugly for us, go, you know what? There is someone who still loves me. He has always loved me. He loved me before I was created, and he's going to love me after I die. He's brought me into his kingdom. I need to be happy about that. And that's my happy thought. You know, when Peter Pan, I like that. You can only fly with fairy dust if you have a happy thought. And it has to be a genuine happy thought. So when we look at this, this is our first happy thought. You want to fly above everything? You want to be above the world and the misery of it? Your first happy thought should be, I'm redeemed. I am redeemed. I am precious. But see, here we have a problem. Because Satan wants to bring you down. He wants to rip that happy thought out of your head. And how does he do it? 
How does Satan rip this happy thought out? Well, he does it all the time, and a lot of Christians, and everyone falls under this. Not just Christians, but everyone. And here's his first temptation. He wants to remind you of your past. He says, look, remember when you did this 40 years ago? Do you remember when you did this 30 years ago? Do you remember when you did this 20 years ago? Do you remember this when you did this 10 years ago? Let's go five years ago. Let's go a year ago. Let's go six months ago. Let's go a month ago. Let's go yesterday. Do you remember? See, when, when you did that, you told God you didn't love him anymore. So God doesn't love you anymore. Satan wants to remind us that we have past sins. He wants to guilt us into remembering them and letting them affect us and drive us from God, drive us from the happiness that we have knowing that we've been redeemed. He wants to remind us of this so that we do not focus that we are saved, but we are focused that we are unworthy. That's what Satan wants to do to us. He wants to take that happy thought and crush it. And we give in to it. When we say, you know what, Satan, you're right. How can God love me when I've done this, 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 this? Oh, my whole life's a train wreck. How can he love me? He can't redeem me. I am unredeemable. We've given in to that trap that Satan says, yeah, that's it. Once you start believing that, you'll believe everything I tell you, and there's no escape for you. But what we have to remember is, even if we sin, even if we try to walk away from God, we look at the Old Testament. And we look at the New Testament, and we see all these times that people try to run from God, hide from God, and God says, oh no, you can't run from me. You can't hide from me. I see you, and I still love you. That's why we have the Word of God to remind us of those times in our lives. We look at other people, and we say, wow, look at everything they did wrong, and God still loved them. God still wanted to be a part with them. He wanted to be hanging with them. He wanted to join them. He wanted them to join him. He didn't want them to walk away. It's their choice. But he's always saying, hey, I'm right there with you. I see what's going on. I've forgiven you of that. You just got to let it go. So Satan wants to take this away from us. Well, there's a second thing Satan wants to take away from us. Our second thing is the knowledge that we have a refuge in our Lord. We have a safe haven in our Lord. Satan wants to rip that down from us. And he does it in so many ways. The ways he does it is he tells us, look, you know, have you seen the crime rate in your community? It's horrible. Have you seen the lack of income coming into people? It's horrible. Do you know where your finances are going? Right down the tube. It's horrible. There will not be any meat in the meat markets. Trust me, they're all going to be gone. You're all going to be vegetarians, which to me and some others, that's like, what? I got squirrels on my property. I ain't concerned. Don't let the city know that though, please. So Satan wants us to remember our past sins and then he wants us to look at the miserableness going on around us and convince us we have no hope. We have no place to go. No place to hide. No salvation from the miseries that are coming upon us right now. He wants us to believe that lie. But we don't have to believe that lie. We don't have to give into that lie at all. Because if we look in Psalms 46, it tells us this. God is our refuge and our strength. An ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. You see, God tells us that He has a place of peace. And He also tells us God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts, the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolation he has brought on the earth. You see, God's going to allow bad things to happen. And yet, God says, here I am. Here I am to save you. I am a refuge. I will protect you if you rely on me. But see, that's the thing Satan doesn't want us to do. He doesn't want us to trust God. He wants us 
to look to our own means of salvation, our own means of refuge. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to look at life and say, ooh, it's scary, it's ugly. I've got to retreat within myself. I've got to find my own safety net. I've got to find my own refuge. But as a Christian, we know, yes, it's going to roar outside. Mountains are going to fall. Wars are going to happen. Chaos is going to rule. But God is in control. My happy thought is, when bad things happen around me, not only am I redeemed and saved, but God has got my back. He's going to protect me. He's going to watch over me. And there's going to be times I'm going to look and go, ooh, how can God help me in this situation? And God says, if you trust me, if you truly trust me, you'll wait and you'll see. And I will not let you down. So my happy thought is, another one is, that I have a refuge in God. No matter what goes on around me, it's all good. God's in control. He has my back on. I'm going to be protected. You know, what does that mean to us though? Well, as a Christian, that knowledge of a refuge means this. God is listening to us. When you pray, God is listening to you. When you just talk in general to Him, He's listening to you. God is providing for you. You don't have to worry about, is there going to be meat for me? Is there going to be this for me? God is going to have everything we need and it's already ready for us. He's planned it out throughout our life. He knows the times when we're going to be in need and we're going to be in want. And he says, I've already provided that for you, if you trust me. And the other one is, God is always present with us. Though the mountains crash and no wars come and no plague and disease come upon us, God has not abandoned us. He is with us right now. He's with you where you're sitting at right now. He's with you wherever you go. So take that in mind when you go to the store and you're like, oh no, I might catch the disease out there right now. I might catch that virus. Well, God is with you. And if you use your smarts and keep clean, wash your hands and things like that and avoid coughing people and other things, God's still with you. He says, don't be fearful. Just trust me. I'll be with you. Now, the final thing that makes me happy. The final happiness that I have knowing that I'm a Christian and the joy that comes with it is that I, you, will reign with God forever. We're his children. And he's got a place for us. And I keep talking about that place that's for us. You know why I keep talking about that? Because it's important we remind ourselves daily that this earth is not our last place. This earth is not our home. Our home is where God is. That is our last place, our final stop. And it's going to last forever. Not this place. We will reign with the Lord. It says in Revelations 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will be no need to light a lamp or light the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You see, Satan wants us to forget about that. He wants to think about what's here and now. This is the important part, right? This is what you need to worry about. And this is where you need to focus your life on. Well, that's not true. That's not true at all. God says, look, these things are going to pass. These things are all going to go away. Someone else will own your house. Someone else will own your car. Someone else will own what you already own eventually. So it's not yours. It never was yours. You're just a caretaker at the moment. Someone else is going to own this building when we all die. They're going to be the caretakers of it. But Satan wants us to think this is the all in all. He wants to take our happiness away because, oh, my house just burnt down, so my life's done. I'm done. Just chalk it up and let's go on with life. Let's forget about it. I'm done. Oh, I've lost this. I've lost that. Well, life's done now. Satan wants us to think that, but that's not true because this is not our life. Where our life is, is where God is. We will get to see and be with the people that have moved on, who knew redemption, who knew the life of God, We'll get to move on with them. We'll get to see them one time after this. And we'll get to visit with them for eternity, along with our Lord and Savior. This will not be the end. So let me ask you, what is holding you back?
feedback from happiness that God gives you. I've met a lot of people and they say, you know, Ron, I've been a Christian all my life, but I'm really not happy. Well, my question is, why not? Where's your happy thought? What are you looking at? Are you looking at what the world offers or are you looking at what God tells you? What has Satan thrown at you that you've chosen to accept? Because most of the time, that's what it is. When someone says, I am not happy, it's because they've allowed Satan into their life to present to them something and they've accepted that as truth instead of the lies that it is. What is your reason for not being happy? Is it because someone died that you knew as a Christian as well? And you're mad at God? Is it because the life you wanted is not the life that God had planned for you, but being a Christian, you're trying to follow God's plan instead of the life you want? And that makes you miserable? Really, you should be ecstatic that you're still following the plan that God has because God's plan is way better than what you think you want. You know, it's like a kid who wants a new bike. Well, he gets it, but it's not as cool as his friend's bikes. So that new bike is good for about six months. And he's like, Mom, Dad, I'm bored with this bike. I need a new bike. Or to put it in more modern times, you give a kid a video game. Well, that's cool for about three weeks. Then he wants a new video game because that video game's old. He's played it. It's boring. Let me have a new one. Or, you know, I have this phone, and it's cool. It's an iPhone 3, or it's an iPhone 7, it's an iPhone 9. But I need the newest iPhones. I have a uh, phone right now that's an S10, but I want the S20. Not really, but, you know, that's the attitude. I want the new thing because I'm not satisfied with what I already have. So are you one of those people who are not happy because you're not satisfied with what God has planned for you, given you, and you want more? You want to be like someone else? You want something someone else has? What is the reason you're not happy? That's what you have to ask yourself. Well, I've got a plan to, to help you be happy. And here it is. How to be happy. First off, you have to let go of what is gone. Which means... You have to let go of your past mistakes. You have to let go of your past sins. You have to let go of your past as a whole and say, that is my past. That I had before I knew God. Now that I know God and I know Jesus, that's gone. It's like water flowing under a bridge. You can only grab what's right there at that moment. You can't go back and grab it after it's past you. Let it go. You don't need that. Fresh water's coming down. Plus, let go of the things you desire and start focusing on the things God wants you to have. And those are always going to be what helps benefit the ministry, what benefits the church, what benefits God in your life. That's the things God wants you to focus on. Secondly, be grateful for what remains. What remains, once you let go of your past, is God's presence with you. God's love for you. Jesus is with you. That's what remains. When you let go of all that was old and ugly and sinful, you only have God with you at that point. Because Satan says, if you don't want to accept that, I can't, I can't hang with you, dude, because uh, I, I want to hang with you, but you're accepting God. And I can't be in God's presence, so I'm out of here. Thirdly, be grateful and look forward to what is coming. What is coming? Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but sometime we will die. And when we do, what we can look forward to is an eternity with our Savior, who paid a great price for us, and who said, I love you. I loved you before creation, I love you when you were created, and I love you after. That's what we have to look forward to. So again, let go of what is gone, be grateful for what remains and look forward to what is coming. We're going to go into our communion time now.